listening to us live in the theatre or watching us streamed over social channels. I'm Professor Lydia Hayes, I'm head of Kent Law School and we're at our beautiful campus in Canterbury in the UK. Our school has been at the cutting edge of critical approaches to the study of law for well over 50 years. Back in 2008, the school established its Centre for Critical International Law so that it could provide a home, an intellectual home, for the growing number of colleagues at Kent Law School who located their academic research and writing in matters of international law as observed through a critical lens, which foregrounds questions of power. The aim was to provide a springboard for the furtherance of critical scholarship in international law, to encourage the engagement of our students in questions about the formation, operation, role, scope and impact of international law and its consequences and to use innovative methods to connect like-minded academics and students in the UK and internationally. Membership of the Centre includes postgraduate research students. The Centre runs a range of activities from film screenings to skills workshops, research paper discussions and an annual lecture given by a critical international lawyer. Seven years ago, Professor Pia Zumbanson gave the Centre for Critical International Law's inaugural lecture on the role of non-state actors and public and private law dimensions in global governance. In 2015-2016, Professor Jerry Simpson of the London School of Economics provided us with a critical reflection on the conceptual history of crimes against humanity. In 2017, we welcomed Professor Vasuki Nasaya from New York University to provide her insights on the issue of reparations, taking a fresh look at claims made throughout history and connecting them across time. Professor Anne Orford gave the 2017-18 annual lecture for the Centre on surplus population and the history of international law. Richard Drayton, Rhodes Professor of Imperial History at King's College, gave our lecture in 2018 about the role of the British Empire in the embedding of persistent forms of global inequality in private international law. The Centre for Critical International Law Annual Lecture for 2019-2020 was provided by Professor Susan Marks of the London School of Economics, who spoke of the quest for dignity in the relationship between international law and human rights. Our event last year was online, with the co-finders of the Global Legal Action Network, Geroid Okunin and Iwanis Kalpuzos, who discussed their experience of developing an agenda for international human rights action to address areas of structural global inequality and injustice. Which brings us to this evening's event with Professor Michael Fackery, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. We are honoured that such a long list of esteemed scholars have joined us and together have created a rich and impressive annual series of lectures in critical international law. Professor Fakri, thank you for giving us your time and your attention this evening. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Luis Aslava, who works with our colleagues, Dr. Sarah Kendall and Dr. Emily Haslam to lead the Center for Critical International Law. Together, they lead much of our international law teaching of undergraduates and the postgraduate pathways of our master's LLM programs in international criminal justice, human rights, international environmental law, international commercial law, international law and international relations. Luis and Michael have written together 
and they share a passion for scholarship which highlights the politics of international law, the need for transformation, and the urgency with which people around the world need to see action taken to push back against inequality, poverty, and of course, food insecurity. So for a fuller introduction to Michael and his work, I'll now hand over to Luis. Thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, um, welcome again to the Center for Critical International Law 2021-2022 annual lecture. My name is Luis Eslava, and together with Dr. Emily Haslam and, Sarah, and Dr. Sarah Kendall, I co-direct the Center for Critical International Law at Ken Law School. I would like to express with you our fortune to be able to host as our speaker for tonight's annual lecture, Professor Michael, Michael Fakhry. The annual lecture celebrates the work done here at Kent Law School at the Division for the Study of Law, Society, and Social Justice at the University of Kent, across the UK, and across the world on international law. In particular, we aim to celebrate with the annual lecture the work of scholars, practitioners, and activists dedicated to the study of the broad operation of the international legal order and to advance new ways for us to exist in this planet in a more just and less destructive ways. At the heart of the work that we celebrate with these annual lectures is a commitment to both interdisciplinarity and a profound respect for the field that brings us together tonight, international law. We embrace that respect in a critical way, which for us means studying the international legal order in its current and possible future relations to the global political economic order, the natural environment, and our global society. Over the past few years, we have been facing an unprecedented series of challenges with the COVID-19 pandemic, the refugee crisis, the deepening of poverty and food insecurity, populism, Brexit, and today's a devastating work taking place next door. We thought that the best way to pay respect to the importance and the seriousness of these events was to dedicate this year's annual lecture to the right to food and to hear it about from no one else than Professor Fakhry. Professor Fakhry, uh, Fakhry, I just used to call him Michael. Michael is a professor at the University of Oregon School of Law where he teaches courses on human rights, food law, development, and commercial law. He's also the director of the Food Resiliency Project in the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center at the same university. He holds a doctorate from the University of Toronto, a master's from Harvard Law School, a bachelor's, a bachelor's of law from Queen's University, and a bachelor of, Social, uh, of science in ecology from Western University. Michael has taught courses on the right to food at Harvard Law School, the European University Institute, and the University of Arizona Indigenous Governance Program. And also, he has delivered lectures in South Africa, Egypt, Lebanon, Qatar, Singapore, Italy, Italy Switzerland, Iceland, the United States, and beyond. He has also led public dialogues on human rights and development with peasants organizations, led by unions and human rights activists in the Arab region and North America, and international organizations, including the WTO last year, and very soon he will be appearing before the Human Rights Council for the first time. During his practice as a lawyer, Michael, uh, Michael <laughs> again, uh, <laughs> fought for the rights of people who were uh, indigent, uh, indigent and incarcerated in psychiatric institutions. And in his work as a scholar, he has produced a, a, a series of seminar works that have redefined the fields of international economic law international trade law, and global food systems, and the history of such systems. His book, Sugar and the Making of International Law, published by Cambridge University Press in 2014, has been an inspiration for many of us um, to how to, on how to do a different history of international law that takes seriously the role of third world countries in the making of international law, and how such attempts have encountered bitter 
resistance from global north powers. Our collective uh, uh, book, Bandung Global History and International Law, co-edited with Basuki Nisia and, and myself, and uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, was cited by the International Court of Justice in the groundbreaking advisory opinion on the Chagos Island. Michael was appointed a special rapporteur on the right to food by the Human Rights Council in March 2020. Over the last couple of years, in this very, very difficult time, he has already redirected global attention towards the key role of international trade law in the maldistribution of food in the planet. And he has been recently requested by the UN General Assembly to produce a report on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the right to food. From the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank Michael for making time to visit us at the University of Kent and for making this his first international trip since the pandemic started. Before I conclude, I want to thank colleagues across Kent Law School, LSSJ Division, the University Public Engagement Office, and the Press Office, and especially KMTE, for supporting this year's annual lecture. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Michael. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I don't take it for granted, the fact that we're gathered here in person and everyone online as well. It's been difficult just to, just to be in a room together. So I really, really appreciate you today. And thank you to all the organizers who worked so hard to make this happen. I'm not gonna list all of you because I'm a little jet lagged and inevitably I will forget names, but you know who you are and really thank you so much. I appreciate also the warm welcome I received today from the community in Thanet. I learned from the community members today and their warm welcome was, uh, was just extraordinary. And I have to say most importantly, thank you to everyone on my end who allowed me to make it happen and to be here today. I'd like to thank my in-laws, Dominic and um, Marianne Romano, my spouse, Lisa Romano, and my cousins who moved from Lebanon recently um, because of the situation there who live with us in Eugene, uh, Tamara Nassif and Jad al-Hajj. Without them, I wouldn't be here today. I used to take gatherings like this for granted, but now, as I said, I, I feel this is something quite special. I also appreciate that many university faculty in the United Kingdom are just coming out of a strike. And my work on the right to food is profoundly influenced by scores of academics in the UK. Universities in the UK have been an incredible uh, place for international legal scholarship and practice, Kent Law School being an exemplar. I don't have a sense of politics of the legal profession in the United Kingdom, but I can say that if faculty in the UK continue to be impoverished, I know that international legal thought and practice on a global scale will also be poor. As Luis mentioned, this is my first trip since the pandemic started. This visit to the University of Kent and my engagement with the Food Foundation and wider community over the past two days has been incredible. It's been inspiring. But I have to admit, it's been surreal. Leaving the bubble of pandemic parenting and arriving into a full-on community engagement with no real COVID rules has been intense, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> The reason I accepted this generous invitation and made my first pandemic trip was because Luis, Slava invited me. Luis is an old friend and comrade and we've been through a lot together. And I also accepted this invitation as an opportunity to see other friends and comrades whom I love and miss dearly. So thank you for those of you that made the trip here. So I wanna start this talk in the spirit of solidarity and friendship. And I hope by the end of this talk, you'll join me in this spirit of solidarity and friendship. I'll be speaking today about the radical potential of the right to food. And of course, a big part of this talk is influenced by my experience as UN Spe Special Rapporteur on the right to food for the past two years. So my talk today is a culmination of my research um, and that practice. And to be clear, I'm speaking today in my personal ca capacity as a middle-aged Arab who's a little jet lagged. 
I'm not speaking in my official capacity as a UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food. In my UN work, I often get asked my advice on a particular legal campaign around the right to food. And I don't have a predetermined answer in terms of what is good or effective, uh, a good or effective right to food legal campaign. For example, the socio-legal context in Lebanon will be very different than the UK. Scotland's context is very different than Northern Ireland, England and Wales. Birmingham is going to be different than Carmarthen. Sometimes a legal campaign is about constitutional law. This is, for example, in Chile. Or maybe the right to food is already in the Constitution, and it's about activating or articulating that right, as in Mexico. Or a right to food campaign could be about passing explicit right to food legislation, as in the case in different parts of the UK. It could be even something geared towards city government or school districts. And I wonder what a right to food university would look like. These are all tactical choices. My focus today is on the international scale. What would an international legal agenda look like for the right to food? What would a legal agenda look like that does not limit the right to food's radical potential? I've been working in the world of law for about two decades now. But sometimes I find it a bit odd that I've gone deep now into this world of human rights. I'm aligned with the many traditions that are cautious about law's emancipatory potential. More particularly, I come from a tradition of international law that has been very suspicious of human rights law. This tradition, third world approaches to international law, often uh, referred to as TWAIL, is actually wary of all international law. International law has been and continues to be a part of imperial adventures. In turn, imperialism in all its different forms as it continues today has been central and continues to be central to international law. But Twail doesn't abandon international law just yet because that seeds too much ground too quickly. In Twail, we maintain a critical stance against international law, but we also always look for tactical opportunities for resistance within international law. If Twail had a rhythm, it would be the rhythm of other critical traditions, critique and resist, critique, resist. At the, largest, at the last large-scale TWEL conference that was held, this was the 2015 TWEL conference in Cairo, there was a call to expand TWEL's praxis beyond the academy. Much of the discu discussion of praxis, or some people would say theory and practice, focuses on the tensions and limits of working within institutional structures. In his keynote address at the TWEL conference in Cairo, uh, Georges Abissab described the life of an international lawyer working within institutions to be something like operating behind enemy lines. The institutional uh, technique is generally to critique and resist. Today, I want to amplify another element that is part of critical international legal practice broadly. So we have critique and resist, but I want to make sure we also resist and build, resist and build. Those two refrains should be playing in our ears at all times, critique and resist, resist and build. How each one of us perform or articulate those rhythms is really a personal choice based on our style, methodology, or sense of political timing. What keeps all of this moving my understanding of how change happens is always about people's ability to organize. My answer to any political question is always organize, organize, organize. The reason I titled today's talk The Right to Food's Radical Potential and not The Right to Food's International Legal Agenda is because of how I understand change. My premise is that the radical potential of the right to food will be fully realized, not through some ideal law or legal agenda as such. The right to food's radical potential will come through people's ability to work together and organize. This is why I, in this talk, I don't discuss the specific meaning of the right to food until the end. The meaning of the right to food matters. And in most contexts, that's what I usually focus on. But in most contexts, I'm in a tactical setting where people's focus is what is to be done in the immediate sense. Today, I want to spend most of my time outlining things in terms of what should the right to food international legal agenda look like so that lawyers and scholars can serve and work in solidarity with social movements. 
When I started my academic career, I quickly abandoned human rights and turned to law and development. At the time, I felt that law and development gave me a better understanding of the structural problems at play. What inspired me to become a special rapporteur was the food sovereignty movement. This movement that began in the mid-1990s by peasant movements and that quickly expanded to include fishers, pastoralists, indigenous peoples, this movement that gave the right to food its radical power. And it's the food and agricultural unions that also brought their power, along with them international labor law, that makes the right to food an opportunity for all these different social movements to come together on a global scale and potentially change food systems all over the world. My work as Special Rapporteur, my lecture today, my work for the foreseeable future will be dedicated to connecting TWAIL to these movements, to connect an academic movement to the social movements to work together on particular campaigns, to expand the legal horizon of the right to food, and to transform the world's food systems. If we change our food system, we are in effect changing our relationship to the land, to all beings, to each other as humans. If you change the food system, you change everything. I'll talk more about these social movements, but let me tell you what I plan to do for the remaining time. I won't spend too much time on the refrain of critique and resist. What I'll do, I'll just provide a quick summary right now in terms of the critiques of human rights. There are many, and I'll just highlight a few. So these long-standing critiques are, I'll give you four, but there's, of course, more. One, human rights are limited because they focus too much on individual claims and not structural problems. Two, human rights can limit agency by forcing everyone to compete against each other as victims. Three, human rights are often used to justify military attacks and occupation. And four, sometimes human rights limits political possibilities by focusing on the process of recognizing rights and not substantive issues. And these are all true in many ways, but that does not mean human rights is not also able to be deployed as part of a collective action and in militant terms. So I have critique and resist playing in the background, but today I want to spend most of my time on resistance. I'll present a legal agenda for the right to food. And this is what I'm really going to spend most of my time on. I'll explain why I think the right to food has radical potential for social and historical reasons. I find that the right to food has its own history that doesn't fall into the other narratives about human rights as such. And I point to some doctrinal footholds. So it does get a little legal at some point. I also outline what legal sources I think can animate the right to food in a way that makes it easier for movements to work together and strengthen their bonds of solidarity. I'm always asking myself, how can we continue to make the right to food enable broader and deeper ties amongst people's movements? So in my discussion about resistance, I outline what an international right to food legal agenda looks like. When it comes to the refrain of resist and build, to me it's about particular campaigns. And I don't have time to go into those campaigns today. Um, but what I can tell you that in my work on the right to food, I'm currently focusing on three campaigns. Challenging corporate power, seeds, trade, uh, and trade rather. There it is. So, on corporate power, a lot of people are working on corporate power, and that's a good thing. Uh, and corporations, I closely follow the work of Sandhya Pahuja, and to me, the campaign is not just to limit corporate power, but to challenge the very existence of corporations in the food systems. I took on corporate power in close combat at the UN Food Systems Summit this past September. On seeds, the second uh, campaign, not enough people are working on seeds. Seeds are the foundation of life itself. And here I learned so much from the work of Titilayo Adebola from the University of Aberdeen. Every law school should be teaching a course on seeds as a foundational course for everyone. And I'll be talking about seeds next week before the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And on the third topic, trade. Trade is always a central issue when it comes to food. There have been strong critiques 
of the trade regime for the past 20 years. And I think a lot more can be done developing a constructive trade agenda. And I've started doing that in my official reports with the help of people like Dina Suvala, Sanjay Pahuja, and social movement folk framing things in terms of solidarity economics and territorial markets. So with the refrains of critique and resist, resist and build, playing simultaneously, today I'm focusing on resistance with an emphasis on building new food systems. So here's the plan one. I'll outline this legal agenda I keep promising you. And I will conclude, on the second point, I'll conclude with why the right to food is strong enough to hold this agenda together and what the right to food means. I'm happy when we have our conversation afterwards to talk about corporate power and seeds and trade if you want, or whatever you'd like. Just going to grab some water. Okay, so on resistance. The only reason the right to food has any radical potential today is because of the food sovereignty movement. So I'll give you a short history of that food sovereignty movement, and then I'll go into the details of the social and political landscape today. However, let me first briefly explain what the food sovereignty movements are resisting. What are the workers resisting? They're resisting corporate power and industrial agriculture. Much of the world is plagued by industrial agriculture. Industrialized agriculture and food production have been a breeding ground for pathogens. Meat packing plants around the world have fostered the pandemic, spreading COVID-19 to nearby communities due to poor working conditions and environmental abuses. What is driven, uh, no, excuse me, more broadly, food systems also emit approximately one third of the world's greenhouse gases. Much, uh, what has driven much of this damage has been intensive industrial agriculture and expo export oriented food policies. By treating food like a commodity, industrialized agriculture has demanded greater biological homogenization. This is because the reduction of genetic diversity enables faster growing, harvesting, or slaughtering and transportation. This is a form of monoculture that increases productivity through the simplification of nature, but it also creates ecological conditions that facilitate disease. By prioritizing efficiency, industrial agriculture drives a constant demand for more territory, large-scale monocrop farms which pollute land, air, and water and debase animal life. Approximately one million animal and plant species are now threatened with extin extinction many within decades. Industrial agriculture and corporate power also encourage employers to prioritize profits over workers' rights and treat people like replaceable units. To give you a specific instance of how corporate power has been harmful, industrial intensification was designed to make farmers dependent on the expensive inputs provided by agrochemical companies. Four agrochemical companies control 60% of the global seed market and 75% of the global pesticides market. Such market concentration means that a small number of companies will unfairly control the price and flow of seeds. The big four, as they're known, also produce much, most of the agrochemicals associated with genetically modified seeds. Those agrochemicals reduce biodiversity which lowers agricultural resilience, making farms more vulnerable to climate change shocks. These are the same pesticides that put workers and communities' lives at risk. More generally, the high concentration of corporate power allows a relatively small group of people to shape markets in a way that serves the ultimate goal of shareholder profit maximization and not the public good. In sum, the world has been dominated by corporations and food systems that use wealth to generate more wealth instead of using life to generate more life. Most importantly, the concentration of power through corporations on a global scale is symptomatic of an underlying political economic system that is defined by inequality. The world's richest 1% emit double the carbon of the poorest 
The world's richest have also profited from the pandemic with billionaires' wealth swelling by $1.9 trillion in 2020, while global unemployment skyrocketed. The problems of the world food system stem from the fact that legal building blocks that create a market, contracts and property, have licensed investors to use corporations to financially benefit and harm communities all over the world. So while corporations are the immediate problem, it's the underlying system of property and contracts, let's call it capitalism, that is the issue. <laughs> On resistance in the food sovereignty movements, the food sovereignty movement uh, came about as a global movement in the mid-1990s. It first arose uh, as resistance against the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which, and the WTO came into effect in 1994. In policy and academic circles, trade is usually treated as an issue related to economic growth or development, or depending on what's going on in the world, sometimes it's treated as a geopolitical issue, he says, with Russia expanding its invasion into Ukraine. To the food sovereignty movement, what is at stake in trade law is people's way of life. Peasants, pastoralists, fishers, and indigenous peoples' resistance against the WTO has been an existential fight. The same is true for workers, even if they're not part of the food uh, sovereignty movement as such. Food sovereignty is not against trade. It is against free trade agreements that undo people's long-standing relationships with each other, with the land, with waterways. By the 1990s, peasants and other small-scale food producers around the world were fed up with international economic institutions. They were disappointed with their national governments, and they were cynical when it came to development discourse. For 50 years, most national governments across the third world were preoccupied with development. Regardless of their particular understanding of development, very few governments and advisors were committed to supporting food producers in a way that allowed them to continue their way of life. Many developing countries looked to industry as an alternative to agriculture or looked to industrialize agriculture. International trade in, uh, institutions such as the UN Conference on Trade and Development, known as UNCTAD, and international commodity agreements supported trade in agriculture by trying to stabilize prices. But this was a means, ultimately, to generate capital that enabled shifting to manufacturing. National government's ultimate plan was to disinvest from the agricultural sector and create a cheap work base for the manufacturing sector. Nevertheless, even though rural communities were under attack through these development plans, they still played an influential role in national politics, since most developing countries still relied on agriculture. That means that despite problematic development discourse, peasants could at least rely on UNCTAD and international commodity agreements as international institutions that supported national agriculture. At different times during the 1960s and 1970s in places like Mexico, Ecuador, and Indonesia, national peasant movements mobilized to push against their respective government's industrialization agenda. The nature of these movements changed in the 1980s and 1990s. With the demise of international commodity agreements and a diminishing role of UNCTAD, trade policy was no longer about stabilizing prices. Things, uh, international agricultural trade policy shifted to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, which became the WTO. With that change, rural communities in developing countries no longer had a strong international institutional structure to support national agriculture in any way. Peasants and other small-scale food producers and indigenous peoples around the world, especially in Latin America, began to organize themselves into transnational movements committed to opposing international economic institutions like NAFTA and the World Bank. By May 1993, the movement became global when La Via Campesina was formed in Mons, Belgium. Seven, seven months later, this new movement marched in Geneva against the newly created WTO. On to resistance today. Today, it's about more than La Via Campesina. 
the food sovereignty movement encompasses two network of networks that bring millions of people together. You have the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty and the People's Coalition for Food Sovereignty. These network of networks bring organizations together to debate through differences and find common ground, develop shared concepts, and mount international campaigns, and to decide on how or whether to tactically engage with international law and institutions. What I mean by social movements is these are peasants representing peasants, fishers representing fishers, indigenous peoples representing themselves. During the 1990s, La Via Campesina deployed food sovereignty as a concept, partly to claim and redefine the right to food. And this changed the right to food's meaning. And up until then, the right to food was primarily about uh, the freedom from hunger. La Via Campesina's strategy was to sharpen the difference between pol food policies that fed people but did not have any regard for concentrations of, uh, of power. And they wanted to distinguish that way of doing things versus policies that empowered the large number of decentralized small-scale food producers. They sharpened the difference by how highlighting how food security feeding people without any regard for power. As a technical, so food security is often an issue that is a technical problem of production, sometimes a matter of production, and experts will figure it out, versus food sovereignty, which asks a question of power. Who controls the food system? With this focus on control and power, the food sovereignty movement then deployed human rights discourse. More specifically, they use the right to food in institutional spaces. The right to food gave everyone a common language to rally, a way to connect their different interests and join together against a common problem. The right to food also gave social movements access to institutions. It meant they could find progressive and subversive spaces in different UN organizations and agencies find allies within these institutions who can influence the direction of certain influential reports or policy recommendations. They could extract funds and support from these institutions, all because the right to food was in the institutional mandate. These, well, I keep saying institutions, these are places like the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, uh, most prominently the Committee on World Food Security, the CFS, and to some degree, the Convention on Biodiversity. So to summarize, the right to food gave these different groups a way to work out their differences and work together in common when navigating different international institutions. On to the legal agenda. The movements have given the right to food incredible discursive and doctrinal power. However, that collective struggle is constrained. It's constrained by international institutions and the limits of multilateralism. I think there is an opportunity for the right to food to have stronger organizational power. And for me, that is where the radical potential of the right to food comes from. The power and meaning of the right to food is the power that arises from particular campaigns. The ultimate legal agenda is a tactical question and, a, and very context specific. What ultimately matters the most is the organizational power generated from a particular campaign. Lawyers should rarely lead political campaigns. What we're good at, what we're maybe, yeah, what we're good at is at creating the, part, the particular tools to serve social and political campaigns, and to provide tactical advice. At our most ambitious, we can sometimes be organizers. So with that in mind, let me be more specific what an international legal agenda for the right to food should look like. In people's struggle over issues regarding land and labor when it comes to food, different groups have relied on certain international legal tools. And right now, each one of those legal tools operates more or less on its own. For the right to food, I think it's helpful to start thinking about so the socio-legal landscape by thinking in terms of four constituency groups. 
peasants, indigenous peoples, workers, and that includes migrant workers, and women. The reason I picked these groups is, is in, because these, each one of these groups has a very specific legal tool. Now, people fall in and out of these different groups, or who they are may intersect through all four. Think, for example, of a rural Palestinian woman working in the Israeli agri-food sector. She would intersect through all four of these categories, peasant, indigenous, worker, and a woman. My point is that each constituency has developed their own legal tool. And I think our challenge as a legal community is to braid those legal tools together to create something even stronger. I think the right to food doctrinally and discursively is already strong enough to hold these legal tools together. In braiding these legal tools, we can make it easier for people's movements to continue organizing. I'll start with peasants. So starting with peasants, I'll go back to the food sovereignty movement. One of the other major accomplishments that the food sovereignty movement pulled off is that they managed to, to get past uh, a UN declaration through the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly after a 20-year campaign. So in 2018, the UN General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas often known as UN Drop or UNDROP. So UN Drop is relatively new, but it may have the potential of addressing core issues like seeds and land redistribution. It frames rights in collective terms and as a matter of access to resources. And it includes language regarding food sovereignty. Now the food sovereignty started off primarily driven by peasants, but later on, fishers, pastoralists, and indigenous peoples joined. And now there's a large number of different small food producers involved. So the term peasant is meant to encompass small farmers, artisanal fishers, pastoralists. Sometimes people use the term small food producer. And I've used that sometimes tonight. So it's worth explaining the word peasant. Sometimes the word is used as a pejorative term to denigrate rural people. In Arabic, we do that, filet. Hmm? <laughs> but in a growing number of places, it is a term people are using more often to describe themselves asserting their dignity. Ana filet. With the adoption of the declaration, the word peasant has become a more widely used official term. The declaration defines a peasant. And here, I'll, I'll quote the language. And you have to excuse right, UN language. It's going to be long. <laughs> quote. But it's a generous definition. This is why I think it's worth reading. Any person who engages or seeks to engage alone or in association with others or as a community in small scale agricultural production for subsistence and or for the market and who relies significantly, here's the lawyer move, but not exclusively. <laughs> hmm? on family or household labor and other non-monetized way of organizing labor, and who has a special dependency on an attachment to the land. A special dependency on an attachment to the land. What is very useful about UN Drop is that it explicitly connects to other constituency groups, indigenous peoples, workers, and women. It has the connectors built into it. That idea of a special connection to land takes me to the second constituency group, indigenous peoples. Indigenous people, peoples rather, play a growing role within the food sovereignty movement, but they are very careful emphasizing their unique position and particular struggle. And they have their own legal power, the power of the UN Declaration of, indigenous, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to rely on. The UN Declaration of Indigenous People UN drip, undrip, if you will, has its own social and political history, its own dynamic. And in some ways, the beginning of UN drip starts in the 1970s with the close relationship between the American Indian movement from North America or Turtle Island and third world liberation governments within the UN. They were working in solidarity together. UN drip reaffirms indigenous rights to self-determination. 
One powerful thing it offers is the recognition that no one, no government, no company can access or exploit indigenous people's land and resources without indigenous uh, people's free, prior, and informed consent. Now, what about workers, the third group? The IUF is an international federation of unions and is the core organizing force around millions of food and agricultural workers around the world. The IUF includes workers from almost every aspect of the agri-food sector, from restaurants to farms to factories. And they emphasize the unique position of young workers, women workers, LGBTI workers, and migrant workers. They've been around since 1920, and their sense of political action and policy analysis is extraordinary. This is how they describe themselves. IUF contains multitudes, exclamation mark. Our 399 affiliates in 126 countries make up the, here's the full name, International Union of Food, Agricultural, Hotel, Restaurant, Catering, Tobacco, and Allied Workers Associations. IUF, the Food, Farm, Hotels, and More Global Union over 10 million strong and growing. Who wouldn't want to join that union? <laughs> well, food and agricultural unions have a longer international legal history than peasant movements and indigenous peoples, and they rely on the 100-year history of international labor treaties. A fourth group, women. There was a strong push by feminists within food sovereignty movements, within the unions, to ensure that these movements did not reproduce patriarchal power, as they are prone to do. So I would add the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, popularly known as CEDA, but more specifically, the General Recommendation Number 34 on the Rights of Rural Women of the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Four constituency groups, four legal tools. And of course, we must acknowledge each one of these legal tools has its theoretical limitations. Each one of these legal tools has its practical limitations. And each one of these legal tools can be and has been used regressively to harm the people who need it the most. In my work over the past two years, my recommendation to the different movements has been this. What I've learned as a special rapporteur through my mandate on the right to food, is that my mandate that I hold, it's not mine, I hold the mandate. I'm still getting used to the UN language. The mandate that I hold is only as powerful as the social movements. The stronger they are, the bolder I can be. From my end, I'll continue to try and make the mandate a collective space for the different food sovereignty movements, indigenous peoples, unions, and women. Now on their end, each group has its favorite legal tool because they feel it best serves their particular interest. Each group also knows the limitation of their favorite legal tool. They didn't have to go to Kent Law School to have a critical sensibility. <laughs> the challenge is to wield all of them together to create a social and legal practice that treats these legal tools as if they were coherent and cohesive, that connects them together in a way that consciously focuses on their most radical potential. The movements can create the social reality that makes these legal tools more radical and powerful, but only if these groups find ways to work together more deeply around certain campaigns. That way, the legal meaning of everyone's favorite tool is not limited by institutional politics, but is activated by the social meaning of global mass movement. My recommendation to international lawyers tonight is this. Start creating the jurisprudence that can serve this agenda of solidarity amongst the different movements. I have no doubt we can all critique the different legal tools. And we should continue to work and understand their limitations. Critique and resist. But keep in mind the difference between theoretical limitations and social possibility. Whatever your theoretical style, whatever your methodology, whatever your political sense of timing and sensibility is, keep thinking about UN drop, UNDRIP, 
international labor treaties and CEDAW in tandem in creative and subversive ways. I'm not saying these are the only legal tools. I'm saying these four legal tools are a powerful way to start. For example, I can imagine an, an analysis that asks questions in terms of trying to understand racial capitalism that then tries to develop a plan of action through these four legal tools. The right to food is doctrinally rich enough and institutionally powerful enough that it can provide the framework to hold it all together. So this is the task I'm setting out for myself, myself and I hope you'll all join me, all of you. I'll continue ensuring that I'm in good relations with the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, with the People's Coalition for Food Sovereignty, with the IUF, and any people's movement working along similar terms, such as in Thanet today. And I hope we can make the right to food a tool that generates the organizational power that strengthens everyone together. So let me talk about resisting and building and why I think the right to food can hold all of this together. So I began my talk with a quick summary noting how human rights can be discussed in terms of critique and resistance. And then I focused on resistance and I provided you with a legal agenda for the right to food and how it can serve and how we can serve rather social movements in their struggles. And as I said, I don't have time to get into the particular campaigns, but to remind you about those campaigns in terms of resistance and building, one, resisting and building against corporate power, two, focusing on seeds, and three, constructing a new trade agenda. So I'll end now uh, by explaining how the right to food is doctrinally rich enough to hold all of this together. And I want to highlight the fact that it offers a wide range of international institutions that we can either engage with or resist against. The right to food is articulated in Article 11 of the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It falls first under the broad heading regarding standard of living. But within this Article 11 on standard of living, it's really unique. It ha it's the most detailed right um, in the whole covenant, one could argue, but especially in this particular covenant uh, section on standard of living. This is for historical reasons. And this history gives you a sense of the right to food's unique path, wide scope, and institutional power. It's because, primarily, of a campaign led by B.R. Sen, who used to be the director general of the FAO from 1956 to 1967. Sen started off his career as an Indian diplomat. He was very clever and used the right to food to change the FAO. He turned it from an institution that was strict, mostly gathered and published statistics. And using the right to food, he transformed the FAO to become an institution that created and implemented specific development programs. And because of his maneuvering, what he did was he was present during the negotiations of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. He successfully argued that hunger is such an important issue that it warrants specific enumeration within the covenant. It's not just about saying there is a right to food. The covenant explains how that right to food is to be realized, meaning it doesn't leave it to each state. International law tells the states what to do. In turn, he went back to FAO, to the council, and said, they're dealing with hunger in Geneva. We can't let them do that. We need to pass a right to food provision in our constitution. And sure enough, that's what happened. So now, the FAO, in its constitutional mandate, it says that part of its mandate is to ensure that people are free from hunger, which is the language of the right to food of the time. So as a result, a doctrinal result is that Article 11 of the Covenant starts in paragraph 1, recognizing the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living, and then enumerates the right uh, of a standard, uh, adequate standard of living to include adequate food, clothing, and housing, and to a continuous improvement of living conditions. It also includes international cooperation as part of this right. So already the right is framed in terms of international institutions. That's what international cooperation meant in the 60s. And not just individual claims. 
That's section one. Section two, paragraph two of Article 11, goes on explaining the right to food. It leaves, unfortunately, it leaves housing and clothing aside and focuses on food in great detail. And it emphasizes that this is an individual right based on international cooperation. And there's four elements here. One, it's about improving food production and conservation. Two, it's about sharing and using technical and scientific knowledge, including nutrition. Three, efficiently using resources to develop and reform agrarian food systems. And four, to take account of trade in order to ensure an equitable distribution of world food supplies in relation to meat. I'll say them again, but in more general terms. So the right to food is about one, production and conservation, two, knowledge, three, reforming agrarian food systems, and four, fair trade. This creates an incredibly wide range and great number of concepts to engage with, contest, and deploy. So to go back to my refrains of critique and resist, resist and build, the critique would be to push against the 1960s development discourse infusing Article 11 and the right to food as, as in the covenant. And so you can rely on the way right to food discourse has progressed today and rely more less on development and more on notions of food sovereignty and agroecology. So you can scrub out all of that development discourse and infuse in the right to food with notions of food sovereignty and agroecology. And you're left with a large number of concepts to build with. So I'll list. So international cooperation is not just about international institutions, but we can frame it in more modern terms understood as international solidarity. My comrade Obior Okafor is the special independent ex the UN independent expert on solidarity. There is meaning to this word. Two, so that's international cooperation. Two, food production and conservation can be reframed uh, less in terms of economic growth and more in terms of increasing biodiversity. Three, knowledge. Knowledge is not just technical and scientific, but includes traditional and indigenous knowledge, or you could call it experiential knowledge. Four, access to resources and agrarian reform of food systems is not just a matter of efficiency, but a matter of justice. And five, equitable trade is not just supply management, but is a matter of food sovereignty. That's the critique and resist and transformation we can do. I just did it in three minutes. It's not hard. What the right to food already offers today is the ability to engage with a wide range of institutions, and not just the Human Rights Council or human rights institutions. It has allowed me, in two years, as a grumpy middle-aged man yelling into his computer, already I've directly engaged with institutions in Geneva and Rome, and I'll just give you the list, because I think it's worth naming names. The International Labor Organization, the World Trade Organization, UNCTAD, UPOV, which is about breeders' rights, the WHO, the International Plant Treaty, which is about seeds and farmers' rights, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the Committee on World Food Security, um, the International Fund for Agriculture and Development, the World Food Program, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. These are all institutions that I've developed a relationship because of the right to food. And I think at some point I'm, I'm going to engage with the Convention on Biodiversity. It's just a matter of time. In other words, the right to food enables a long march through these institutions to confront oppressive forces from within and out with, to use that lovely Scottish word, out with these institutions at the same time. I'm not there to compromise. I'm there to win. <laughs> to conclude, food should be something that makes people stronger physically. Food should also be something that makes people stronger politically and culturally. In this respect, the right to food raises fundamental questions about the way people make, share, and eat food that cannot be ultimately answered by technocrats or experts. 
The right to food can put questions of trade, agriculture, land use, environment, health, and food policy into the hands of the people enhancing their collective self-reliance. You may have noticed I haven't explicitly defined the right to food for this past hour. In doctrinal terms, the right to food means food must be adequate, available, and accessible. What that means in, in uh, clearer terms is that everyone should be able to get good food at all times, whether directly from the land and waterways or through fair and stable markets or through whatever mechanism of mutual assistance. And that people should have the power to decide what is good food for their own community and decide for themselves what it means to eat with dignity. When I started this position as a UN Special Rapporteur, I had to articulate a meaning for the right to food that it had its own power to carry people for, uh, through whatever struggles lay ahead. My first report where I provided that, defi uh, uh, that definition, we were in the early days of the pandemic um, when the entire world stopped and we didn't know what was going on. I started my mandate, when was it? So March was locked down. May, I started as rapporteur. I had to have a report in by June. So in preparing for today, I reread that first report that I wrote in those early days of the pandemic when everything was incredibly intense. And looking back, it felt like a surreal blur. And the way I wrote about the right to food in the early months of the pandemic reads today like dis a dispatch from the front lines. So I'll, to conclude, I'll share with you that definition of the right to food that I was articulating at that moment and that I continue to carry with me and I think about it all the time. I offer it to you today. The right to food is the right for everyone to celebrate life through their meals which, with each other in communion. Thank you very much and I look forward to our conversation. Promise you a big annual lecture, and he was delivered, of course. <laughs> um, so we welcome uh, questions from the public here, and also from people uh, watching us uh, through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, they're coming through my mobile phone, but we should start with the people <laughs> present. Um, so um, there are a couple of uh, lovely mics. Uh, so um, please keep your questions short. Uh, and just to give everyone a, a fair chance to interact with Michael. Who would like to start? Thank you very much, Margarita Prieto Acosta. Um, thank you very much for such an address, very, very important. Food has moved the world and history a full continent was discovered looking for food. Mm. What an achievement. Mm. Um, unfortunately, the legal system protects uh, agribusiness and, of course, pharmaceutical companies, impoverishing, as you have said, the pool of di biodiversity. In this moment, at this moment, we are dealing with 150 uh, staple foods. Mm. That's nothing compared with what indigenous and peasants move in local um, farms and um, communities around the world. My question is how to empower these groups mm. that are so special in terms of resistance to increase the pool and in fact giving the right uh, scope and value to such an important right as it is the food. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can answer, yeah. Um, thank you, that's a fantastic question and it's a very generous question. So, you know, I provided the legal agenda and the way I always start thinking, you know, let's, we have to acknowledge where people are at. Everyone's really tired. 
Everyone's really, really tired and under attack. All of us, every single person. And some of us aren't making it through. Hmm? But we have to take care of each other. That's what I hear in your question. So start where it's easiest, which is start in your own community. And for example, so your, your question on Pez, start with your local farmers. Start with your local food system. And then understand what power you have also in your own political system in the international landscape. Why is your government subsidizing this over that? Why is your government supporting this group versus that group? Why is the government supporting corporations? Hmm? So starting to think in those immediate terms, you know, so I focus on the professional, but it's sort of expanding to your point in terms of political activism. And I didn't say it lightly when I said, what, what would it mean for a university to be a right to food university? Students are hungry, staff are hungry, faculty are hungry. But you live in such a rich landscape here. It's a beautiful, you know, I saw trees and land and space. Start here, start with the solidarity. There's migrants here, undocumented people, they're right here. And from there, people are already connecting in these whoops, international solidarity movements. And I met them. You have local activists already tapped into those movements. Ask around. The movement is already happening. Join it. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for that. That was really uh, amazing to hear. And my question perhaps does come from a little bit of ignorance on my end, but I was wondering when it comes to the question of seeds and seed banks, mm. Is there a specific protection when it comes to the context of conflict? Uh, I come from the Levant, so the question of the robbing of seed banks in both Syria and Iraq has been uh, a very big one that I even had students come and ask me about. So that would be the first segment of the question. And another one would be general curiosity onto the reaction of corporation towards your mandate. Uh, as I imagine, interactions with them could be quite complex. So any reflections on how has that been uh, would be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Those are tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, on seeds, no, that's exactly, you know, we're from the same part of the world. We're neighbors, right? Um, probably cousins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that's the first to go. So what happened in Syria, for example, is they had to move. There's a national seed bank, um, and they had to move it to Lebanon. And you know it's rough when Lebanon is considered more stable. <laughs> And then they had to move it, I think, maybe, uh, maybe it's now also in Morocco was some of those seeds. There's a, also a seed bank in Svalbard in Norway, which is sort of the ultimate backstop. Every country puts its seeds in that, they call it a seed bank. In case of emergency, they withdraw it. And Syria was the only country that had to pull its seeds out. The only way you keep seeds is you can't just stick it in a freezer. You have to keep planting. The seeds only last a few years. So that's just, OK, that's the botany lesson. On the legal side, this is the fight. This is what I'm going to the Human Rights Council to talk about, talk about in, in the shortest form. There's a version of understanding seeds as commodities. And there's two ways of turning a seed into a commodity, into intellectual property. One, it's this treaty called UPOV, and that's the French acronym. And you have to excuse me, I forget its full name. So UPOV. That one says, well, seeds are created by breeders. Breeders are commercial folk. They grow the plant, and they sell it, or whatever. Um, there's in the United States, they patent seeds. Mine, not yours. Now, breeders, breed, breeders' rights is like a European softer version of patenting, but they're both treating seeds as property. The other fight is to treat seeds as something we all share, as something that's free. Now, just because it's free doesn't mean there's rules. To make something free, we have to have complex systems. And in fact, the only reason we have biodiversity is because farmers throughout millennia have constantly been sharing, using, and growing seeds through complex systems, through their culture, through knowledge. And in the other treaty, the fight is that's happening is um, the short version is sometimes called the Plant Treaty or the International Plant Treaty. And it's this idea of farmers' rights. And the, the part where everyone's trying to figure out was what does farmers' rights mean? So the plant treaty says, there are farmers' rights. What does it mean? Ah. <laughs> and it's worth it. So what's, what's exhilarating about the fight over seeds from a legal perspective 
is this issue of seeds and property and and UPOV and breeders' rights, politically, there's just been no action. They sort of, they have their doctrines and they just, they're holding ground. But the energy around defining farmers' rights was reinvigorated by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other Rural People. It said there are farmers' rights and it added a bit more political energy. So there's, the, the movements have more power on defining farmers' rights. They're on, I don't wanna use war terms, but they're on the attack. Whereas uh, the people who are treating seeds as property are on the defensive. So that's the report. It just, my report just came out last week and it's a mix between very a very technical argument, but it's also uh, articulating seeds in cultural terms. And the way I learned it, so uh, you know, in my consultations with movements and experts, they kept saying, remember, seeds are about knowledge. And I'm like, yes, yeah, seeds are about knowledge. What does that mean? <laughs> And it happened over uh, Christmas. My cousin, so like I said, Tamara and Jad, they came from Lebanon. They're younger they're in their, than me. They're in their 20s. And I'm, they don't know I'm going on about this seed report and I'm tearing out what few little hair I have left. And I'm like, what, the, what am I gonna do? I have to teach myself intellectual property law on the fly. And it's Christmas time and I gotta figure out what to buy for my boy. And ah! And part of the Christmas gift they, they brought is they came home and they had sprouted, sort of secretly, they sprouted uh, lentils and wheat. Because that's what our grandmother used to do. And I'm like, well, of course. That's what it means that seeds are cultural. And that's what it means that seeds are knowledge. And that's what it means that seeds are life. And I, I started asking around with my team, with everyone I knew, you must have holidays. Everyone has holidays. What role do seeds play in what you do? Iranian friends had a story. Italian friends had a story. Everyone has a story of how you celebrate life through seeds. Without seeds, it's, oh, it's over. Whoever controls the seeds controls life. That's what's at stake. Was, did I answer your, was there anything? Yeah, okay, thank you. How, to what time are we? I'll leave it to you. You be the bad guy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just um, wondered how large is the gap in practice between a person in extreme poverty and hunger and enforcement of the right to food? So how real is the right to food in terms of putting food on the table? In the United Kingdom? Well, I don't know, can you give any examples of any cases elsewhere where someone's actually enforced the right to food? I'm sure, so the term enforcement is interesting. It depends, you know, we can have this discussion. Is the right to food something that you can go before a judge and the judge gives you an order? In some contexts, the answer is yes. India is an example where it has a justiciable right to food. But I think if you only think in terms of a judge enforcing an order, you limit the institutional and doctrinal power of the right to food. That's why I was focusing on its organizational power and it's about the campaign. And where you get sort of the change is, can you instill the right to food and in how institutions actually operate? So you can have a right to, I'll give you an example. Brazil around in previous uh, governments enacted the right to food, not as something that you necessarily go to a judge and get enforcement, but they instilled it in how they connected schools and fed uh, school children and empowered local farmers, and they did it like this. They said, okay, schools, you must feed all children. Full stop, universal meals for all children. Not are you poor, are you deserving, eat good food. Okay, what's good food mean? Ah, schools, you must procure food from at least X percent from local farmers committed to agroecology and indigenous farmers. We're now feeding the community. We didn't have to go to a judge. We put the law into action through an institution. Right? But I'm reluctant to answer it even more because every legal political context, that's why I said, do you mean United Kingdom? The legal context starts to matter. The campaign that's going on in Scotland, the Good Food Bill, is, gonna, is something very different than what you would have to do here in England. It would be something very different than Wales and definitely something very different than Northern Ireland. So that's where it becomes a very tactical decision. 
And I can say that groups in the UK are coming together from what I saw yesterday, right? People at University of Kent are starting to build momentum to make sure your answer, the answer to your question hopefully will be yes sometime soon. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, I'm Sophie Vigneur. I'm a member of staff of Kent Law School, and I suppose my research is about cultural heritage. So, I just found your presentation absolutely fascinating. And to come back to lentils, I mean, I'm French, hmm. and for me, lentils are the le puy lentils, you know, the little green ones. Yeah. And the first time I came to the UK, I saw red lentils. Mm. I mean, I had no idea that something like that existed. Yeah. It was really eye-opening. But as you want to come back to that, I think you you mentioned in your last question about. Uh, the right to food and the know-how and also of, of food, food production. You mentioned peasants and indigenous people. So this, to me, from my research, is about intangible heritage. Mm. About uh, So what is the cooperation at your level, between with the uh, international, the UN Special Rapporteur with cultural rights? Is there any cooperation with uh, people who are involved in the protection of intangible heritage and know-how? Um, so I think that's, that's my question. Yeah. That's a so I'm asking myself that same question. I'm at the point where I, I'm going to email you is what I, my answer because, <laughs> because my t I'm not being flippant. My answer is I don't know. And I'm that, but that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out because I'm still ambivalent about... So I, one pushback I got from someone today, the email arrived. Um, that they are confident that intellectual property rights are a good way to protect cultural knowledge and to protect um, intangible uh, uh, knowledge that way. And I, I'm ambivalent. I'm like, I don't know. The word property is still there. <laughs> huh? So I don't know the choices that are available. I don't know the legal tools that are available to then really push hard on acknowledging and protecting and framing it as what's at stake is cultural culture. And I have to turn to others to go there. Yeah. Hi. Thank you uh, for the uh, for the talk. Really, really fascinating and, and certainly learned, learned a lot. Um, I suppose my question is, 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 is about pay, uh, patterns. You, mm. kind of, you kind of mentioned it. I suppose pattern is, is, is an example of how the property owner is able to extract rent. Mm. Effectively, it's, 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 it's a form of unearned income, mm. which, which allows you know, the, the person to be able to, to, to yeah, uh, uh, obtain income without doing any work. Mm. That's why it's effectively it's, it's, it's kind of immoral. And in fact, you know, Adam Smith talked about how uh, landowners often reap what they have not sown. Mm. You know, um, um, but at the same time, there within within the and, and there are other examples. You know, you, you mm -hmm. talked about the, mm -hmm. uh, the the monopolies how they're able to push up the price, which is also another form of rent extraction. Mm -hmm. um, so, to what extent is your critique in part? Uh, a, 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 a a kind of uh, um, um, a, a way of saying that, that that we should do more to tackle unearned income uh. Uh, to, to, because because in part it's also immoral or unjust it's this form of unjust enrichment right it's also a form of extraction because it allows those who own huge amount of uh, uh, um, uh, land uh, or, or, or people of commodity, which is valuable, scarce, like a pattern, yeah. able to extract even more from those who need Indeed. it, i.e. the peasant told us, yeah. who then invariably they go into debt. Yeah. I mean, I mean, well, one of the things that you, you didn't quite mention, uh, finance, which is also right, an important of course, part that's of there. the interlocking nature of markets. So yeah, so, so I suppose it's how neoliberalism has legitimized unearned income yeah. to such an extent that we normalize it. All of us here are Rontiers, yeah. to, to use the kind of uh, kind of jargon, yeah. petty or large, yeah. and and how culturally we have accepted it. So 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 so, so in terms of the resistance, I suppose. Yeah. What would you do to try to push back about the undeserved income yeah. that property owners obtain? Thanks. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. There's another question outside. Yeah. Let's take it. That's faster.
Um, I come from India, and so um, my thoughts are with the farmers who, who I mean, mm. who you are very, might be very familiar, who've been committing suicides for a mm. couple of decades mm. at least. Um, and also, I'm drawing my thoughts, I'm drawing inspiration from Vandana Shiva's work and mm -hmm. seed sovereignty and mm -hmm. sustainable farming. So, linking that and what you said, and in, 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 the, in the legal framework that you presented for mm -hmm. right to food, are you foreseeing it to be an individual right or collective right? Mm. One question. Secondly, is there scope for criminal corporate responsibility in that framework? Mm. Thank you for both of those questions. So, we conclude. Sounds good. So, on unearned income, I think, you know, I, I started thinking in those terms exactly. And what's nice about seeds is it forced me then to get very, um, I don't want to say concrete because I'm talking about seeds, right? To get dirty. Hmm. That's the word, huh? Specific about something tangible. Um, and, I struggled, I, so I started thinking in those terms, but I thought, I'm not talking about income, though. I'm not talking about a farmer making money off of the seed. They might make m money, they, obviously they have to sell stuff, and they have a livelihood that's at stake. So I thought, seeds, I don't want to frame what's at stake in terms of income. And so I turned to Susan Marx's work on exploitation. That was the concept that helped me a lot, and reading her work on exploitation. The other thing is I use her work on dignity. I, her lecture here two years ago saved my butt. I needed something, and she gave the gift of the understanding of dignity. But on exploitation, and it allowed me to link understandings of exploiting workers, which there's a lot of, you know, a long tradition, and the exploitation of farmers. But it wasn't just work, but about exploiting their relationship with the land, the long-standing relationship and what exploitation means is that the few benefit from the long-standing relationship people have with the land. So that's how I've started to sort of work through that a bit more. On uh, right to food, is it collective? Is it individual? I'm reluctant to answer, but I'm not going to be flippant. What I mean is it, it can be defined as a collective right easily because it's written that way. Hmm? My general, and the way the social movements deploy it is as a collective right. But I'm reluctant to go too hard and fast to say, but of course it can be an individual right, because in, I'm not, I don't want to block that in any way. And certain legal systems are only going to be more responsive in the immediate term as an individual right. So what I will say is the right to food is both, and it's a tactical choice based on the context. Um, and then in terms of criminal uh, uh, corporate social responsibility, the challenge there, and Shah had asked me a question, now I remember, I, I, didn't, I forgot the, on how corporations have responded to my work, and I'll connect those two. Um, I haven't engaged two directly, and they are clever enough not to attack me in a direct and clear way. They do it by proxy. Mm. There's that. And where I'm at now is my understanding from the movements is the energy they're putting on is not corporate social responsibility, but on the treaty that's being currently negotiated um, because they want to push for an international treaty that um, forces governments to hold corporations liable for violations of human rights. And part of what I'm going to be doing in Geneva is meeting with different groups to get a sense of how can I connect the right to food to that. But what I don't hear enough, and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not going to tell movements what to do, but what does it mean to get the corporations out of food systems in the first place? I don't want them liable, to hold them liable. I want them out. They've only, we've only had a corporatized food system in the last 60 years is really when it happened, right? We can easily, and most people easily, feed each other in a way that also feeds the land without corporations. You remove, whoops, so, but we still need cooperatives, uh, other forms of organizing uh, people and resources, and those are there. Um, so, you know, in law schools, we teach um, corporate law or business associations or company law or whatever people call it as a core course. Why aren't we teaching social and solidarity economics or social and solidarity legal forms also as a core course? 
And say so corporations are one way of doing it, and so are cooperatives, and so are mutual assistants, and so are stuff we make up all the time, right? And bring it down a notch so that when we get rid of corporations, and we can stop teaching about them, the knowledge is there, right? The knowledge is there. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Michael once again, and please join me to thank you for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And again, on behalf of uh, um, Sarah and Emily and the Center for Critical International Law, thanks for the time for being here with us. And again, thanks, Key MTV for uh, making uh, this uh, annual lecture available to the world uh, through different social media channels and to be with us and our students in a documentary that uh, they are recording on the right to food. Uh, then it will be shared through Critical Law TV uh, program. Thank you. <laughs>